Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Narayanan, and um, this paper is in collaboration with my advisor, Dr. Carlos R. Rivero. I am a PhD student at Rochester Institute of Technology, and today I will be talking about my paper, which is titled A Method for Assessing Inference Patterns Captured by Embedding Models in Knowledge Graphs. So to get started with, let's first talk about what is a knowledge graph. So knowledge graphs are multi-relational graphs, also structured representations of real-world information, where the nodes are entities and the edges between these nodes are termed as relations. Edges in a knowledge graph can also be represented in the form of a triple, where it's, uh, a triple is the subject, the predicate, and the object. Below is an example of what an edge would look like in a knowledge graph, and on the right-hand side is its triple representation, where June is the subject, the predicate is works, and finally the object is Acme. Um, knowledge graphs contain a lot of information, and um, these, this information cannot be accessed directly and needs to be distilled into some mathematical formulation. So how do we do that? Well, um, we use something called as knowledge graph embeddings. So what exactly are knowledge graph embeddings? Um, they can be termed as numerical vectors that encode semantic and structural information in a knowledge graph. These embeddings are assigned to every single entity and relation in the knowledge graph, and these embeddings are expected to actually capture the information that is contained in the knowledge graph. These embeddings are used in the form of a scoring function, where um, the scoring function takes in um, the embeddings of the subject, the predicate, and the object of a triple, and it outputs one singular value score, which measures the plausibility of the triple. So when we're talking about embeddings, the goal when we're creating the embeddings is that we want to maximize the plausibility of triples that are appearing in the graph. These are termed as positive triples. And we want to minimize the plausibility of the triples that do not appear in the graph. These are termed as negative triples. Below is an example of what an embedding would look like. Here, it's just a three-dimensional embedding. Um, but in practice, these embeddings are much, much larger as they capture a lot of information. Um, how do we actually measure the quality or the accuracy of these embeddings? Um, we use something called as link prediction evaluation. Specifically, link prediction is the process of predicting new links in the knowledge graph. But um, the link prediction evaluation protocol is used to evaluate the accuracy of these knowledge graph embeddings. Um, there are two prerequisites that are important here. The first one is that the graph is split into train validation and test splits. And the second one is that the knowledge graph embeddings themselves are trained using the train and validation splits and are actually evaluated using the test split. But how does this actually happen in practice? Um, it's a lot of formulas here, but I'll try to explain it the best way I can. Um, so basically, given a triple with the subject, the predicate, and the object, what we want to do is that we want to generate its subject corruptions and its object corruptions. The idea here is that we replace S with every single other entity that appears in the graph, or we replace O with every other entity that appears in the graph, such that this new resulting triple is actually a triple that does not appear in the graph. Um, after we do that, we rank, we run all our negative triples through the scoring function, and we rank all our triples in ascending order. And the idea here is that we want to measure the position of the positive triple with respect to its negative triples. Ideally, uh, in a model that has actually learned the graph and has learned all of the information that's contained in the graph, we'd expect the subject rank of the triple to be one, indicating that it's the most plausible, and the object rank indicating that it's the most uh, plausible when we're talking about object corruptions. But in practice, this is not usually the case because um, knowledge graphs contain a lot of missing information, and um, the process of link prediction evaluate—I mean, link prediction itself is this idea that since knowledge graphs are mostly incomplete, you will actually have a lot of negative triples that are ranked higher than um, information that we know is true. Finally, before we get into the main topic, I also want to talk about inference patterns. Um, inference patterns, also rules, are rules that characterize the behavior of the model, and a knowledge graph embedding model should be able to learn these inference patterns. Um, talking about an inference pattern, it can be uh, thought of as a body and a head. Um, here, what it means is that if the body is true, then this would imply that the head is also true. An example of an inference pattern is uh, here below. What this is basically saying is that if X, an entity, works at a company Z, and this company is located in location Y, then this would imply that X lives in Y. And this is sort of the reasoning that we as a human being would be able to do, but it's not so clear for a model to do. So it kind of becomes important to understand 
how well a model is able to capture, uh, how well a knowledge graph embedding model is able to capture these types of inference patterns. So let's talk about the problem statement. Currently, in theoretical research, um, there is a lot of work that goes into trying to understand what models, uh, what knowledge graph embedding models are able to capture patterns. Here I have six commonly occurring patterns that are studied. Um, we have hierarchy, symmetry, anti-symmetry, inversion, intersection, transitivity, and composition. Basically, what this graph, is, uh, what this table is trying to do is that there is two kind of settings that theoretical research usually works on when trying to understand um, how well these embedding models are actually able to capture commonly occurring inference patterns. The first tick mark or the cross mark, basically the first column, um, it talks about how models are able to capture patterns independently. So what this means is that the model is only able to capture a, one specific pattern at a time. This is fine, but it's not really desirable as in practice the model should be able to capture multiple inference patterns at a given time. And that's essentially what the second column is saying. Um, the second column basically is trying to um, see what models are able to capture inference patterns jointly. That means um, it's able to capture more than one inference pattern at a time. As you can see in this table, there's a lot of missing, um, missing uh, results. And uh, even on, um, like independently, a lot of these models have been studied. But when we're talking about jointly being able to capture these inference patterns, that's uh, something that's missing from current theoretical research. So let's talk about some of the shortcomings um, in terms of these theoretical studies. The first one, like I mentioned, is that patterns are actually studied in isolation. In practice, uh, and in most models, patterns must be learned jointly. Um, what this means is that the same model must be able to capture multiple patterns at a given time. The second one is that theoretical studies are challenging and are missing in most cases, like we saw in the previous table. Um, Another drawback here is that results are binary. What this means is that these results only focus on whether the model can capture a pattern or not, but do not actually quantify to what extent a pattern is captured by these embedding models. Finally, the third one is that these pattern capturing analysis only focus on positive triples, that is the triples that appear in the graph, but they do not study if these models are actually capable of discerning the negatives that were used to actually train our embedding models. So let's talk about the method methodology. But basically, what we're trying to do here is that we're trying to create a model agnostic framework to measure to what extent an embedding model is able to capture an inference pattern. By model agnostic, I mean that it's independent of the inner workings of an embedding model. So you can take in any knowledge graph embedding model and our method should be able to um, assess to what degree a pattern is captured by that embedding model. So the first step in this process is a process called the collection of predictions. So we took a look at the um, link prediction evaluation process. But basically, when I said that I, in ideal cases, we expect the rank to be 1, um, that's not what happens in, pro in practice. So in practice, triples that were ranked higher than the positive triple under evaluation are actually predictions that the model is making. Basically, what this model is saying is that there were a lot of missing triples that it predicted to be true. So we propose to collect these predictions, the top k predictions, for each triple in the evaluation process. Secondly, we want to mine core patterns from our original graph itself. Um, to do this, we use a rule mining technique called as Amy. Um, given a rule, there are two main things that we're considering important. The first one is positive evidence. You can think of this as true positives. Uh, and the second one is the negative evidence, which is the false positives. So basically, given a rule or an inference pattern, we measure the positive evidence, which is the true positives. And we also measure the negative evidence, which is the false positives. Talking about our actual framework itself, OK. It's a little bit weird. But essentially, how we're going to go about this is that we construct two separate graphs. The first one is the original graph itself, which contains the train, the validation, and the test split. The second one is the predictions graph, which is a combination of the train, the validation, and the predictions. Given our core patterns, we estimate, I mean, we measure the positive and the negative evidence for both G and GPR. And then we conduct a similarity between the positive evidences and the negative evidences. So what we really want to see here is um, our similarity higher or equal to 1, which is basically saying that the model is able to capture the inference pattern, or 0, which is basically saying that the model is unable to capture the inference pattern. Ideally, when the rank of the model is 1, which basically means that no negative triple was deemed plausible, 
G-test and G-PR will be the same. So therefore, our similarity will be one. And that's essentially what we want to see um, when we're talking about a really accurate embedding model. So let's talk a little bit about results. And I won't go into too much detail here. You can see it in the paper or come for the poster session. Um, so we evaluated our methods on five commonly used data sets and nine commonly available embedding models. The choice for the embedding models was made in such a way that each embedding model was applying its own mathematical formulation that was completely distinct from each other. Um, we used AMI, which is a rule mining technique to extract core patterns from the graphs. We extracted the core patterns that are commonly studied, but we also extracted several patterns that have never been explored before. And they are termed as generic intersection, backward transitivity, equality, composition, and commonality. And you can look at these in more detail in the paper. Finally, to present our results, we grouped the patterns by type and computed the arithmetic mean of positive and negative evidences. Um, to talk a little bit about the core pattern results, um, in our WordNet data sets, we observed that several models actually are able to capture um, patterns with high accuracy when the theoretical study states that these models were not actually expected to capture these patterns. Um, we hypothesize that this can be attributed to the presence of redundant triples and inverse triples that are present in uh, WordNet datasets. Regarding the boxy model, which is supposedly able to capture all inference patterns, we observe that um, it is not amongst the best for performing models when we're talking about accuracy. And finally, regarding the negative evidence, which is the false positives, we observe that all models fail to capture this information. Um, this suggests that these models are actually fail to capture PCA. Regarding our new patterns um, that we discovered, we observed that the behavior of the models is really all over the place. There is really no clear answer, and um, theoretical research is also sort of missing. So there's no way to tell which models are theoretically able to capture um, these patterns. But when we're talking about negative evidence, again, we see that um, the values are all over the place. So to conclude, um, we present a model agnostic method to empirically measure how embedding models capture inference patterns. This is based on the process of link prediction evaluation. Um, our empirical assessment considers different patterns uh, of the same type, so it also considers how, multiple, how the model is able to learn multiple patterns at once. Our empirical results indicate that several models fail to actually capture this negative evidence. And finally, um, in certain data sets, we observe that a substantial portion of positive and negative evidence can actually be found in the train and validation splits. Regarding future work, um, we want to study the impact of different training options. Basically, we want to study how hyperparameters and other associated um, training options will actually affect the ability of the model to capture inference patterns. Secondly, we want to actually understand why these models fail to capture negative evidence even though they were trained under this PCA assumption, which is an assumption used to train the models. And finally, in these challenging data sets like BioKG and HetianNet that I talked about, um, we want to explore different methods of actually partitioning the graphs so that um, most of the evidence cannot be found in the train and the validation splits. That's it. Does anybody have any questions?